Gillian, it's been just so long since I've seen you. I can't wait to catch up. I know. So how have you been? Can I take your order? Yes. I'll have the chicken salad. And I'll have the grilled chicken breast. Thank you. I have been great. Really? How did school go this past semester? It went really well. I got a, ended up with a 4.0. That's great. You know, you worked so hard, you really deserve that. I had some good news, too. I just got um, an award for being nominated for Who's Who in American Junior Colleges. Oh, really? That's wonderful. Yeah, I was, I was pretty happy. So in everyday conversation, we naturally pick out the most important points of information to tell our friends. We don't tell them everything that's happened since the last time we saw them, and we don't necessarily tell them in the order that it happened. Frank, did you hear about him? Yeah, what happened to Frank? He had an emergency appendectomy someday last week. I can't remember what, but he just thought he had an upset stomach. Uh -huh. For example, when someone asks you how things are going or how you've been, you don't start by telling them that after you woke up this morning, you brushed your teeth and then had cereal for breakfast. Instead, you go straight to the one or two things that are most important. Perhaps you recently got out of the hospital or you just quit your job or you've started going out with someone new. It's a pretty straightforward process and one that we all carry out fairly easily. Why then do we seem to get so nervous when having to write a research paper, when the process is much the same as having a simple conversation with a friend? Yeah, I do. Listen, well, that's, I'm gonna spend um, two weeks in Colorado, so yeah. that'll be. As you sit down to that blank sheet of paper or empty computer screen to start your first draft, Think about organizing your thoughts in the same way as when you are talking to another person. Take, for example, the way you might frame a conversation with your parents or spouse if you want to convince them that you need a new car. Before you state your case, no doubt you will first spend a little time developing your arguments and putting them in order so that you can list the most important and persuasive reasons first. Of all the reasons you have for wanting a new car, you know that starting with, I hate the color of my old car, isn't going to get you anywhere. If you want to sway opinion, you think instead of the most important reason and present that first. So you start your conversation with, I just got a $2,000 estimate to repair my car, and that's more than the car's worth. Now you have the basis for a sound argument. As you begin to write the first draft of your research paper, you can think of it as the same kind of process. Present your ideas and findings in order of importance and impact so that you can support your thesis and convince your readers. And in writing a paper, you actually have a bigger advantage than when arguing a point with a friend. You have notes and you have an outline. Organizing your information is a little like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You have all the pieces you need. Now it is simply a matter of putting them together in the proper order. Like the picture on the front of the box which guides you in putting the puzzle together, your written outline helps you decide how to order your notes. First start by separating your cards by topic headings. Since the headings on your note cards helped determine the main headings for your outline, you will be organizing your cards in the same way. Once all your information has been divided into categories, you need to order the information to correspond with your outline. But don't treat your outline as if it's set in stone. You may find that same piece of information fits better some other place. Or you may have found a new article with current information that needs to be included somewhere. So before beginning to write your first draft, Look again at your note cards and outline to make sure you've got everything you want in the order that you want and that it makes sense. There is no one correct way to begin putting words on paper. You may want to begin at the beginning with the introduction, but there's no reason to. If, for example, you can't think of a good way to start your paper, you can just as well begin by developing the body paragraphs of the paper and later go back to write the introduction. 
Whichever way you choose to begin, the writing will go better if you set some goals for yourself, perhaps to write one section in a prescribed period of time. Writing the first draft of your paper involves matching the outline to your detailed notes. Think of the outline like a skeleton. The notes will flesh out the skeleton into a full body. And, of course, writing requires more than copying summarized and paraphrased notes in some logical order. Without your own thoughts and perceptions guiding the paper, your essay would be like a boat drifting down a river with no one to steer it. Your ideas provide direction. Your interpretation of the information helps the reader make sense of all the raw data so that it's more than a jumble of miscellaneous ideas lumped together. Writing the first draft involves following the outline, expanding each thought in the outline with the use of your notes, and bridging all of this information together with your own thoughts and transitions. Let's see how this works. Here is the outline we wrote for a paper on lotteries. For this paper, the thesis was, Lotteries attract many people who normally wouldn't gamble, but who are willing to spend a few dollars for the possibility of a great return. You may want to skip over the introduction for now, because you want to get a feel for what you will say in the body of the paper before introducing it. Your first main heading is Marketing and Persuasive Techniques, and under that you have A. Targeting Specific Audiences, 1. Interviews with Advertising Executives, Two, sample ads. On your note cards, you have the following information relating to this subheading. In selling the lottery to the public, there are three messages advertising tries to deliver. First, that playing the lottery is fun. Second, that the lottery can make dreams come true. And third, that it's easy to play. These messages are aimed at all audiences. Advertising executives say there are two audiences they are particularly interested in. The working class person who might see the lottery as the chance of a lifetime, and members of the upscale yuppie market who have lots of cash to play the game. As they stand now, these notes could probably be inserted directly into your paper as they are, except for two problems. The first problem is that you need to be sure you aren't plagiarizing your resource material. Plagiarism is presenting someone else's ideas or words as if they were your own without crediting the other person for making those statements. The dictionary definition of plagiarism goes so far as to call it the stealing of an idea. Obviously, if you were to write down what another person wrote word for word and didn't credit them, this would be outright plagiarism. But even if you take a quote and paraphrase it, you may still run the risk of plagiarizing or stealing that writer's ideas. Changing just a few words here and there is not enough. So you need to credit the sources for your information. According to an article in Gambling Magazine, for example, or Les Perlman, an advertising executive with one of the leading agencies in California, says that then you can go on and paraphrase your source according to your notes. The second thing you need to be cautious about when transferring your notes into your rough draft is that ideas must connect logically. You will have many note cards from several different sources. If you merely paste and glue all these notes together, you'll be jumping from one idea to another without smooth transitions. Connecting the thoughts from your note cards requires transitions and explanations. This is where your own writing comes in. In some cases, you need only a few connective phrases to take the reader from one idea to another. Phrases like, for example, in contrast, in addition to, in fact, or ironically enough, often help bridge two ideas together. Let's look at the last paragraph we wrote. Advertising executives say there are two audiences they are particularly interested in. The working class person who might see the lottery as the chance of a lifetime, and members of the upscale yuppie market who have lots of cash to play the game. Now we need to get from that idea to the next main idea in the outline, TV and newspaper ads and billboards. One way to flow into that thought is to start the next paragraph with, in fact, TV and newspaper ads and billboards are clearly aimed at these two audiences. For example, 
Now you can look at your note cards for examples of ads aimed at either the Yelpie or the working class market. But unlike your notes for the previous subheading, these note cards may require more of your own ideas and interpretations because you're referring to an ad rather than an article or book. For example, People win millions playing Megabucks every week. Stop. Once you win Megabucks, Welcome on, Mr. Tui. life will never be the same. Incorporating this ad into your essay requires some explanation. You'll have to describe the ad in your own words and then explain why you think this is a good example of marketing to the working class audience. So unlike the first subheading, where you wrote down most of your paraphrase or summarized your note cards verbatim and credited the source, this time you'll be writing your own ideas and analysis using the note cards only as reference. As you write, you will come across quotations which you may want to incorporate into the essay. Because your paper is an original composition, you do not want to rely too heavily on the words of others. On the other hand, a research paper with no quotations lacks credibility. Quotations can give your paper more authority, and they provide flavor. Using quotations can be confusing. You are told to quote, but to do so cautiously. Here are some guidelines for choosing quotations for your paper. Use a quote when presenting specialized or technical information, such as statistics. For example, September 1st, 1939. The German army crashes through the Polish border. Three million Jews are caught in the trap of Nazi authority. Nazi stormtroopers went door to door, village to village, uprooting entire Jewish communities and herding them into prison-like ghettos. The largest ghetto was in Warsaw, where the Nazis walled some 400,000 Jews into an area of little more than a square mile. In two years, one in every five people in the ghetto died of disease or starvation. Use a quote when the material is memorable or unique in its expression. On April 18, 1943, the SS moved in to liquidate the ghetto. It was the eve of Passover, when Jews traditionally celebrate their liberation from slavery in Egypt. Untrained civilians with primitive Molotov cocktails and pistols dared to take on the well-drilled German army. They were physically worn down, with only a few primitive weapons, alone, facing death on all sides. There was nothing to lose. They had to fight. Use a quote when an idea conflicts with the mainstream of thought. The question was not that one man, Hitler, was so evil, but that millions had not the courage to be good. Use a quote to present an important, significant, or key thought by an authority. Let us therefore remember well the signposts on the road to genocide. First, individual rights were revoked. Then individual dignity was denied. And finally, in the abyss of despair, came the murder itself. And genocide succeeded because the defenders of individual rights allowed themselves to be divided because they sought refuge in illusion and in weakness. Using quotations can pose special problems for the writer. After all, you can't just drop a quote into your paper as if it stands by itself. Just as paraphrases and summaries need to be worked into the text of your paper, quotations must be integrated and made part of the whole essay as well. Again, we're concerned about the flow. How well do the thoughts leading up to the quote set up the quote itself? Take a look at this example. New York City's School Safety Division has counted more than 1,500 incidents of violence in high schools in the past year. 
It seems like almost once a week or every other week we have another kid get shot, says Safety Division Director Ed Muir. In this case, the quote backs up the statistics in the preceding sentence. The quote also provides color to the facts. It makes it more interesting and makes the statistics become real by turning the numbers into real people who were shot. So a quotation should be set up by a sentence or two which precedes it and which helps introduce the idea. You need to maintain a smooth flow when coming out of a quotation as well. Here's where those transitional phrases will help. Therefore, as we have seen, despite this, as well as, these are all examples of phrases which can help you move smoothly to the next thought without confusing the reader. Going back to our example about school violence, let's say we need to move on to a paragraph discussing the pros and cons of frisking students. Coming out of the quote from the safety division director, we could say, as a result of this increase in school violence, school officials have started checking students for weapons when they come in. Now you have moved the reader to your next thought, confiscating students' guns, and you are free to discuss the pros and cons of this practice. Once all of the paragraphs in the body of your paper have been written, you need to compose the introduction and conclusion. In your first draft, the introduction and conclusion will probably be fairly sketchy. But later, when you revise the paper and go through your rewrite, you'll want to concentrate more on the development of the introduction and conclusion. We will consider this in more detail in a later lesson. But for now, as you write your first draft, Think of the introduction as a short overview to your paper. You want to give some, but not a complete picture of what your paper is about. It introduces your audience to the topic in general, and it should contain your thesis statement. For example, let's say that this paper on school violence has the following thesis. The increased number of kids killing kids in schools is due primarily to the increased use and selling of crack cocaine. Besides including this thesis in your introduction, you have to provide a context for that statement. Before you tell your readers what is causing all the killings, you need to introduce the problem itself. Tell us something about the killings. Acquaint us with the problem. You could start with a story that illustrates your point. Jim Johnson was on his way home to tell his mother he just made the high school football team when a classmate shot him in the back. James was the 100th youth to be murdered in this city this year. Many people think the rise in incidents of kids killing kids is due primarily to the increased use and selling of crack cocaine at the high school level. Or you might want to start out with statistics. Since 1980, the crime rate among teenagers has tripled in this city. Murder has been the primary cause of youth deaths this year. However you choose to start, you will need to introduce the reader to the general topic or problem before you state your thesis about that issue. In terms of a conclusion, you want to summarize your thoughts in a concluding paragraph, but avoid overused statements such as, in conclusion, thus we have seen, or to reiterate. We'll go into more detail on how to write a conclusion when we get to the lesson on revising the paper. At this point, you want to get the main ideas crystallized. You can fine tune later. Once you've composed all of the paragraphs in the body of your paper and have at least your first attempt at an introduction and conclusion, you've completed the first draft of your paper. Before you go on to a second draft, you need to document your quotes and facts with proper citations and a complete bibliography. In our next lesson, We'll learn the proper formats to use for your citations, as well as the criteria for deciding when citations are needed. Yes, I was uh, something like 22 years old at the time and had already been made uh, put in charge of the uh, folklore, oral history, and social ethnic studies of the WPA Florida Writers Project. And uh, one day our state director, Dr. 
Corita Kors in Jacksonville uh, popped out of her office and uh, called the editorial staff in and announced that Zora Neale Hurston, the black Florida novelist, was coming on board and was going to pay us a state visit. And um, that uh, she went on to warn us, uh, so to speak, that Zora had been fated uh, by New York literary circles. Uh, she'd already published at least two books and was consequently given to putting on certain airs, as Dr. Kors said, including the smoking of cigarettes in the presence of white folks, and that we would just have to make allowances for Zora. So sure enough, Zora came and Zora smoked and, and we made allowances. Uh, she did most of her work for the project uh, out of her home in Eatonville, and during the 18 months or so that she was with us, and never had a desk to my knowledge. And uh, on occasion, Dr. Kors would come out and ask if anyone heard from Zora, and no one had heard. And so she would look at me and say, you better write her a letter and jog her up. And I would do that, and by return mail, we'd get a very thick packet postmarked Eatonville, one of the most beautiful folk songs and tales anyone ever saw before. And. Um, she was, of course, an extremely valuable uh, uh, adjunct of the project. Uh, she was our only published author. And in my opinion, her ear for idiom was uh, probably second to no other folklorist uh, on earth. And so that uh, her contribution in uh, immortalizing a, a black culture uh, is, you know, without equal, in my opinion. I recall uh, Alan Lomax, the preeminent uh, folk musicologist, worked with Zora in Eatonville as early as 1935. And he was telling me about how Zora had made him paint his face and hands black so they wouldn't attract too much attention to the white folks driving through Eatonville. And uh, he went on to say that in the field, and I certainly concur in this evaluation, that Lomax said that Zora was absolutely magnificent, that she could get anything out of anybody and she would honey up the men so they wouldn't ask for money. And sometimes she would honey them up so good that she'd have to jump in her beat up Chevy and run for our life to get out of the labor camps with the men in hot pursuit. As a folklorist, Zora was uh, uh, not only uh, resourcing people, but she was taking part. If it was a children's game, Zora got into it. Uh, skip rope or whatever ring game she was, Zora was right in there with them. So that uh, there was that sort of, uh, her records at the Library of Congress as a result, instead of saying recorded by Zora Neale Hurston, it says recorded and directed by Zora Neale Hurston. So she literally did direct her, her things. I think it's important uh, for someone to take note of the fact that uh, the black writers such as uh, Zora Hurston and Langston Hughes and Richard Wright were just beginning to be painfully aware that the so-called uh, black uh, Negro dialect, the this, that, these, them, those uh, thing, the Uncle Remus sort of language, was really a put down uh, on the part of uh, white writers. And uh, uh, black writers felt they were obliged to follow suit when, the, when they started putting the language into uh, print. And uh, so these uh, writers in the 30s were beginning to say that let's cut that out and stick to idiom as a means of giving the flavor of, of black English. So that began in the 30s and has proceeded apace uh, to this day. Uh, the black English, in my opinion, uh, has, well, I said something earlier about the value of folk say generally in terms of being high articulate and succinct and a lot of other good things. But uh, to my mind, black English uh, needs to be credited with doing for the English language what uh, Yiddish did for the German in terms of making it lyrical. Uh, English is a pretty barbaric tongue and, and uh, blacks simply uh, weren't satisfied with it and proceeded to turn it into a poetic uh, thing that they could uh, make folk sermons and songs and things out of. So that I think there's a major contribution there that's been neglected, certainly. And the fact that Zora not only put her characters uh, uh, quoting uh, speaking black English in quotes and her folk songs in black English in quotes, 
But when Zora got ready to write an essay or a paper, uh, whatever, a uh, reportage, she uh, very often lapsed into black English very deliberately because, uh, of course, she was highly trained, had been uh, graduated from Bernard and went on to Columbia and Franz Boas. And uh, so that uh, when Zora wrote black English, it was uh, very much on purpose. And again, in my opinion, it's uh, something that should be encouraged. Black English as a mode of expression had uh, not existed in print except inside quotes up until that time, except in the form of the folk sermon. Uh, that was one form of public address where black English was certainly spoken and still is. But in the printed words, Zora pioneered in, in making use of it and having the courage to do it. True or false? Transitions and explanations are needed to connect the thoughts from your note cards. This statement is true. Transitions and explanations are needed to connect your thoughts. Direct quotations add credibility and should be used as often as possible. This statement is false. Although direct quotations can add credibility to your paper, they should be used sparingly. Writing the first draft merely involves copying your notes to match the points in your outline. False. When writing the first draft, you should use your own thoughts and perceptions to guide the paper. You may even revise your outline as you write. A quotation should be set up by one or two sentences which precede it to help introduce the idea. True. Direct quotations should be set up by a lead-in. Rather than change the outline, you should try to make your material fit. False. Outlines may be revised as you write. If you have trouble getting started, you can begin your paper by developing the body paragraphs and write the introduction later. True. Both the introduction and conclusion can be written at some later date. 